Hey guys, welcome back everyone and welcome to those newly joining us here at the House Huddle. I'm excited to start this journey with you on defending Kessinger and man, without wasting any time, let me just say that this has proven to challenge me from every angle as a creator, researcher, reporter, and most humbly, just a human being. The question has been asked, why? Why did I choose to create such a series? I'll first start with my beliefs over the past five years. I've broken up several theories I've had in the Hidden Motive series. Each one of those, you can kind of jump in and you can watch any of them. They don't necessarily have to be in this, you know, in the correct order, but it is interesting to just kind of like, you'll notice in one, I may say one thing and then in the next one, it, it seems like it goes back and forth, but just understand that much like many people in the community will have one theory and then it bounces into another. So anywho, with respect to the Hidden Motive series, I still feel very firmly that this was a family targeted and stalked. However, as I both stepped away from the case and returned, I have to admit that at times I'm noting a shift in the actual discovery of the covert narcissism genuinely hidden between Chris and even the overt one with Kessinger. Where I get caught up is even in my own personal experiences with covert narcissists and abusers, I have seen and witnessed a child or children being the saving grace that one of them needed to keep it together no matter how much they despise the other parent. So is this a ticking time bomb? It most certainly could be. However, it's my opinion that's not at all what we see in this case. And that, along with the alarming statistics in my recent interview with law enforcement, is why I feel rather strongly that the children were at the mercy of the hands of a woman. Before I dive into the interview with law enforcement and the phone ping, there's so much we need to talk about. So bear with me because it's all going to set the stage so that I'm hopefully not answering the same comments repetitively because I love the discussions in the comments, but I feel like if I preface it by explaining why and where topics are coming from, then as you listen, you will have a better understanding of my perspective and why I'm sharing what I'm sharing in addition to why certain things are included in the video. Now, some of this I've had to dig extremely deeply because if any of you have followed along with me from the beginning, I've not shared a lot about my personal experiences as a whole, but I will tell you that I've been the wife that's been cheated on as well as been a single woman in her thirties on dating apps. And let me just tell you more often than not, those things are filled with married men. They all have a story and quote unquote open marriages are actually more common than one would think, yet no one is out there advertising that's what they have. So, I mean, I've seen profiles with both husband and wife looking for an extra, if you will. I mean, thanks, but no thanks. Yet, I believe it's important for us to note that it does exist. And it happens in small towns, in conservative towns, in big cities alike. Don't even get me started on the perverse Bible Belt areas. There are multiple sides to this case. Shanann, Chris, the kids, her family, his family, their mutual friends, his friends, her friends, social media image, Kessinger, Kessinger's family, all the lies, and then ultimately the truth. I'm going to do my best to give the absolute most objective approach to every aspect that has been scrutinized that Kessinger has done or did not do. I will say that if this is already challenging me as a creator to put this uh, series together and believe me, it has. That's why it has taken me almost a month just to get this first episode out. Then I know it will challenge you to do the same. I do ask that you're kind in the comments and if you're sharing your opinion, please state in my opinion or this is how I feel. You know, honestly, I don't even know if I'd say this is how I feel if you have not been in that situation because I'd rather hear from somebody who says, I was in that situation and this is how I felt because I do believe that when we're able to be honest 
um, as a community, then we're going to be able to objectively and honestly evaluate how we perceive and look at Kessinger. And so also because unless you've honestly been in that situation, then you really don't know how you would feel or how you would react because let's just let's just be real like we're all humans and we all have emotions and feelings and until you've ultimately been betrayed like that you really don't know how you would react that goes for both Kessinger and against her I think that's where we're going to see as we dive into this phone ping because you're going to be challenged to look at this through several perspectives you're going to have to take everything that you know or you think you know about this case, the narratives, the opinions of all these Facebook pages, YouTube channels, you're going to have to be able to take it and compartmentalize it in your mind and shove it completely either to the back or out of your mind and go into this series with a brand new vision, clean slate, and I say all that because it's honestly why it's taken so long to get this video out. Because just like so many with this case, one new discovery or perspective shift and you're down an entirely new rabbit hole. So I've done everything possible to remove that and for us to be able to move straight forward. Keeping that in mind, we are going to go all the way back to who Kessinger was. And guys, I say was, because we have all got to keep in mind that this was five years ago. Who she was five years ago is not necessarily who she is today. And it's not fair to even think that that's the case. You and I are not the same person we were five years ago today. At least I hope not. I know that who I was five years ago is not who I am today, thankfully. And good or bad, a person continues to live and develop with each season in life. So please keep that in mind. We are still talking about a human being, even though Lord knows in most groups we have sat her right next to Satan. Please know that in this series, she is not going to be that villain to the best of my ability. In the end of the series, or at the end of the series, I will go back and reflect on each episode, ultimately sharing with you if I feel like I changed my own mind, or do I go back to my original theories that Kessinger was directly responsible for the kids solely and or that she and Shanann tied up in the office or bedroom and Bella walked in and saw it. I will say, Bella stands out to Chris for a reason. And I'll come back to all of that later. This case discovery has fueled the speculation and my ultimate current theory warrants all of the reactions we have seen on both sides of the families. So without jumping ahead, let's get started. We are going to start at the very beginning that I could find on Kessinger, who she was, the crowd she hung out with, choice of college and degree, and what insight that may offer. We're going to look into the history of her parents a little bit and very cautiously because there is a reason there that I believe there's a need for privacy and to some extent I will show you photos of homes I've located and found but I will not share the address with you or where they are as some other creators have done. I will tell you via reference points on maps such as location A, B, and C, etc. I will not tell you which house was what just because it is available on Google. So there's going to be information that yes, I've located that is directly linked to the Kessingers, but I will not dox them. I will not put them at risk for anyone going and doing anything ridiculous because no matter how strongly you may feel for or against somebody, there is still a legal system in our country that I fully support and do believe in. I have interviewed law enforcement and there are certain aspects of it that I firmly believe. She's free for a reason. And we're getting to a point where we are going to have to start accepting what that reason is. And again, at the conclusion of the series, I'll come back and share my final thoughts on these theories. My goal with this series is to prove not only to myself, but to the hundreds of thousands who now question Kessinger all over again. 
They can't fathom Chris doing X, Y, or Z, or even criticizing blame, shame, shenan. And I don't mean that she was cookie cutter. I mean, she lived differently. She parented differently, or maybe had different morals than you or I did, but it's not our place to judge each other because you do not know 100% the truth behind everything. Much like no one wants to really highlight that Lacey Peterson was married to a man that had a thing for hardcore pornography, and yet everyone wants us to believe that she never saw that surface in their entire marriage. I don't believe that for a minute. I think sexual tension within that marriage was solid and strong, resulting in him cheating. And I believe that's why she hid the first affair from everyone and took him back pretending like nothing major had happened. Keeping in mind, she kept it from everyone. He was very open with it with his roommates. Suspended disbelief within a marriage does not mean something did not happen. No matter how classy or cookie cutter something looks, doesn't always mean there isn't something going on beneath the surface. That is something in the true crime community that we have really got to get a handle on. So here's to defending Kessinger, the background and the phone ping. Nicole Lee Kessinger was born on an unspecified date in July, 1988 to parents, Barbara and Dwayne Kessinger. She was born in Colorado. Given public records, it can be concluded she was most likely born in the Denver area. And this was her home turf, so to speak. Born and raised in Colorado, it should be noted that she mentions a birthday trip for July 3rd weekend, and the Venmo receipts point to a birthday night around this time as well. Additionally, we see the card dated July 3rd, 2018 from Chris, where he wishes her a happy birthday. According to the state of Colorado's regulatory agency license search open to the public, her mother is a registered nurse in the state of Colorado with an active and practicing license. Kessinger's father remains employed in Colorado as an engineer. In early 2020, he played an integral role in developing a new ventilator prototype ahead of the COVID crisis. Kessinger mentions that her parents divorced when she and her sister were about the same age as Cece and Bella. So that would put the divorce around the time Nicole was four or five and her sister Stephanie was one or two. That places the year between 1991 and 1992, give or take. Due to time, I was unable to locate the year her mother remarried. However, given Kessinger's parents divorced while she was so young, it's reasonable to think that at least half of her life was spent around her stepfather's family as well. The first time we hear about Kess Nicole Kessinger is the Watts case. And at the time, she was 30 years old even going all the way back to when she was 16 to 18 years old or even younger, she surely had some sort of relationship with her mother. Keep in mind the tone of voice her father uses during the interview and the fact that her mother is a nurse. To me, that says a lot about how a child is raised as well. For example, I can speak from a nurse's perspective. Rarely have I ever met a nurse who coddles their children. We assess their health and then nine times out of 10, they're going their little butts back to school. Every little cough is not a dire emergency. Not to get off track, but I can see how conversations with Chris would have made him question just how sick the girls were at times, which no doubt did not sit well with Shanann. I mean, can you imagine if Chris is con Chris has gone along with the flow for so long and then he meets Kessinger and then, you know, he's having conversations with Kessinger about just life and the kids and mentioning their sicknesses and all of this. And then, you know, Kessinger, having been raised by a nurse, is probably, you know, and this is speculation, but she's, you know, over there going, what the heck, dude? Like, that's ridiculous. Like, they're fine. It's not that big of a deal. We've even heard the same thing from Cindy. And that's not unheard of either. Like, you have one of two types of grandparents. You have grandparents like my mother who would take my kids to the doctor to the point that I had to call the doctor and say, send my mother away and tell her you're not seeing my kid because they were fine. But my mom thought every little sniffle resulted in going to the doctor. Or you have the grandparents who, you know, home remedies or, 
you know, here's some chicken soup and let's nurse you back to health at home. So anyway, what I'm getting at is depending on how you were raised and in the household you grew up in, Shanann is trying to raise her, you know, raise her daughters, raise their kids, and she's the primary caregiver at home with these kids. And then now you've got a husband who suddenly has a differing opinion and it's kind of coming out of left field. Now, depending on how long they've been dating or not, you can imagine like what this would feel like as a wife. You know, you're at home, you're taking care of the kids, he's at work, and he's a great father, you know, from what, everything that we've seen. And yet he starts coming home and where he's not questioned things before, and now he's starting to question things. And, you know, the pushback back and forth, I'm sure that made for some tense, you know, conversations at times. So anyway, what I'm getting at is like, I can see how those conversations with Chris would have made him question just how sick the girls were at times. And in my opinion, that probably did not sit well with Shanann. This was further reinforced during what we now know as Nutgate. In my opinion, this is one of those subject areas where Kessinger's opinions may have genuinely been with good intent, yet caused more harm than she could have ever realized. As in, if she's telling Chris, oh, well, she would have been okay. Like, that's not that big of a deal. I don't understand why it was such a big fuss. And then you've got grandma saying, I really, you know, she really was allergic to something or that, you know, I didn't give the ice cream to her. She went and got it out of the refrigerator. Um, no matter what ultimately happened with Nutgate, you've still got the dynamic of wife is telling husband that it's this bad. And now husband has not one, but two influences saying, dude, your wife is like losing her mind over nothing. So when you consider everything else going on, a simple opinion about something could have just added some more fuel to the fire. And again, I'm not going to get off on the rant as far as what happened that summer, not in this video. Um, So if Kessinger being raised by a nurse taught her anything, it was how at the very least to assess when the child is really sick or at least assess herself. Just ask any school nurse. <laughs> they will tell you that they know what kids have nurses or doctors as parents because they will come in and the kids will be like eight years old or six years old and they'll give a full clinical report to the nurse before the parent is ever called. I remember having the nurse call me one time and she said, I have to ask, but you're a nurse, aren't you? And I said, yes, ma'am. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, I've never had a fourth grader come in and tell me that his throat was sore, but he's pretty sure it's post-nasal drip and that calling his mom was probably not going to result in anything, but her telling him to um, get some water and go back to class. And she and I just busted out laughing over that because it was very true. <laughs> It was exactly the response he had gotten from me before. And, you know, and come to find out, it's exactly what it was. Take him to the doctor. It's post-nasal drip. They can't really do anything about it. You know, obviously you monitor it, make sure it's not strep throat. And um, it was just, it was hilarious. But it's the truth. And so if Kessinger was raised by a nurse, then there's no doubt in my mind, to some degree... That's probably how she was raised too. And so, you know, she was a little, I don't even want to say rough around the edges. She just, she was a little uh, more resilient in different areas. Let's just call it that. So something I've noticed about this case has been the amount of attention everyone seemed to give Kessinger's father, Mr. Kessinger. It's public record that he remarried, as it is also public record that her mother remarried. Now bear with me on this one. What's in a photo? As I was trying to put together a rather extensive background on a woman who has practically vanished from the internet, I have come across several public searches and results, etc. I just followed the breadcrumbs. It's been my theory for a while now that Kessinger had crossed paths with Shanann or Chris or both of them in North Carolina long before they ever moved to Colorado. 
Now I've shared with you this clip of Chris mentioning a time in North Carolina when they were dating, when a woman called him and Shanann found out and flipped she out. Fire like that. Only once in our entire relationship I've ever seen her left that way. Yeah. And that was the a time before or was that on the night that happened? No, it was uh my back in North Carolina. Oh. It was one it was just like one of those just it was just a fiery argument that yeah. I never like I never raised my voice to her or anything and like, you know, I like I just got mad and I slammed the door and she was like, Yeah, I'm like should have slammed the door. Is that when you were in North Carolina that last week? No, it was like previous to that. This was like 2010, 2011. Oh, it was like early, early, early. Okay. And her old house before kids. Yes. Were you dating? Were you married at that point? Dating. Oh. Yeah, it was just like I, I, I don't remember what it was about. I think some, I think some girl maybe texted me like from my past or something, and like I was just like this, and, and she was like, you know, don't have that happen again, and I'm just like. I have friends, right? They're females. Like, right. I don't even talk to this little bit anymore. Right. It was just like, get out. And it's been my theory that the relationship between Chris and Kessinger began sometime in the month of August. However, what remains open is the year. Like, what year? I do not believe the first time they reconnected was that summer. Kessinger says it herself in her interview the first time they met was in June. However, Anthony Brown has them super close in the hallway at work back in March of 2018. And again, I go over this in that August video where the timeline breaks down and it's got them, it lines up perfectly with Shanann um, figuring out that he's talking to someone else or that he's potentially cheating back in March because that's when she starts talking to the divorce attorney. That's also around the time and the date of when people speculate whether or not she, Shanann, in a, a specific male, uh, may have stepped outside of their marriages as well. So March is a very shaky time in 2018. Additionally, at the time of the pregnancy video, Chris notes in his prison interview that he had already begun taking or talking with Kessinger at that time. So we know she was working at Anadarko during this time as well. And the biggest pushback I've received was the big question of, does Kessinger have any reason to be in North Carolina? So, where else do we start but the family tree? One of the only ways I knew to start was to begin with the immediate family and work outward. It didn't take long to make the connection. Kessinger's mother re remarried a man whose mother lives in North Carolina. So that would make Kessinger's step-grandma, if you will, lives in North Carolina. While Dwayne's family seems to remain in other parts of the country, there was a link, direct link between Nicole, Stephanie, Barbara, and even Dwayne listed under the associations with the step-grandmother. So to be clear, this would be Nicole's step or bonus grandmother who lives within this blue circle of addresses in North Carolina. Now, due to privacy and safety considerations, I will refrain from using the complete addresses. However, guys, this is all public and can be found with some time in a Google search. Please remember that this video is for entertainment purposes and raising awareness about the social and domestic issues that continue to grow at an alarming rate. Do not, and I repeat, do not go real life on anyone. The addresses listed in this loop or map are the following. Kessinger's grandmother's three known addresses in North Carolina. Now, does she live at all three of them? No, but this is the residential history of Kessinger's grandmother. Um, three of them in North Carolina. Then you have two separate NASCAR tech schools, which we know is the school that Chris Watts attended. Shanann's house on Peninsula Drive. That one we've seen in pictures and videos. You have the Rusick's house and the Watts home, as well as Dirty South, all on this map. The entire loop is no more than one to one and a half, one and three quarters, um, hours away from Shanann's home, regardless of what point you locate on the map. 
So guys, basically, you can start at Kessinger Graham, Kessinger's grandmother's home and go to any one of the rest of those points and it is going to be no further than an hour and 45 minutes, give or take. So the circle and the proximity to both Chris and Shanann, whether it was Chris or Shanann growing up, Chris or Shanann in high school, Chris or Shanann in college, Chris or Shanann when uh, they lived at Peninsula, um, or at Dirty South, no matter which direction you go, it is no more than an hour and 45 minutes of a drive. The most recent purchased home of Kessinger's step-grandmother was noted on, guess what guys, June 20th, 2018. So there was movement within the Kessinger family, I say Kessinger, within Kessinger's um, bonus family that summer. So again, we don't know what was going on. It would be far too much to speculate, so we won't do that. But the fact is her grandmother bought a house or moved houses in June or on June 20th, 2018. That was the same summer and time that Shanian was with her parents in North Carolina. And before anyone chokes on them, on their gasp and, you know, like, let's keep in mind, we do not know the relationship between Kessinger and her bonus family, both immediate and distant. However, she notes memories made with her sister growing up. And it's worth noting, in my opinion, that they were able to find balance for their family soon and it's more likely than not that Kessinger spent some time visiting both sets of grandparents with both her mother and father, respectively. It's also worth noting that Aberdeen and surrounding towns are not that big. And with the exception of the larger city like Charlotte, it's more likely than not to bump into some familiar faces from time to time. Consider the car shows Shanann worked for Dirty South and showcased their work. Chris's Mustang was even in a show. I keep going back to the same question. Was Kessinger the woman that Chris mentions in the interview that he dated briefly, but she was just getting out of a bad relationship, so he was like the rebound guy? I want to say someone interviewed that girl. I can't put a finger on it. I'm not really sure. Um, or was it possible that Kessinger was a woman he spoke with briefly, either Facebook, social media, at a car show, um, before he ever met Shanann. So think about it, guys. This is, again, let's just say, this is speculation. Let's say Kessinger is in North Carolina one summer visiting her grandmother, whatever. And this is years prior to the murders. You know, she's just going, she's doing her thing. She's going to a car show. She claims she really likes those things. Let's assume she actually liked them before she looked Chris up. And that's where they meet. She bumps into him. He's a cool guy. She has a good conversation. Maybe she doesn't think much of it. Maybe she's smitten with him to start with and they exchange phone numbers. Or much like what happened with Shanann and Chris, maybe because I will say this, after my visit to Aberdeen, because I checked into a couple locations, I noticed when I got back home to Florida that I was getting like friend suggestions through Facebook of people that lived in that area. So it is possible that if he went and, you know, his Mustang was in shows or that they were in some of the same locations and checked in on social media, it is possible that something as innocent as Facebook prompting, hey, maybe you know this person, and they started chatting on Facebook. So keep in mind, Kessinger tells law enforcement that she only met Chris that summer of 2018, which is what makes me think that it was more along the lines of Facebook suggesting a friend request and they started chatting online. 
So because Chris and Shanann only dated a little over a year before getting engaged, it got serious really quickly. And he had to tell this mystery woman that he couldn't talk to her anymore. And that's the phone conversation that Chris mentions in the prison interview is there was a girl that called him out of nowhere. He hadn't really talked to her in forever and Shanann got wind of it and Shanann was pissed. And he's like, well, what? I can't have friends that are girls. So he admits in the prison interview, there was another girl that was trying to reach out and talk to him. Now, I find it hard to believe having studied and, you know, from what I've heard from her family and things like that of her personality, I find it very hard to believe that Shanann did not figure out exactly who he was talking to. I mean, come on girls, you guys know it. You find out your man is talking to another woman, either A, he is straight out the door, or B, you're gonna know exactly who she is and you're gonna know everything about her because you're going straight to Facebook. I mean, let's just keep it real. And so fast forward to a few years later and maybe just maybe Curiosity got the best of Nicole Kessinger and she searches for Chris on Google. Then Shanann, because, well, if you search for Chris Watts, you're going to get Shanann Watts, too. And so she went from Chris to Shanann, and no doubt she studied them both. I don't believe anyone can argue that at all, and I'm going to stop this train of thought because we will end up down another rabbit hole, but I hope you see how some of my theories have been more solidified in my opinion. The fact that someone rather close to Kessinger has lived in North Carolina and not far from either the Watts or the, or the Rusex family for many years, in my opinion, is substantial enough to prove that she had every reason to visit North Carolina long before Shanann and Chris ever met, as well as after they were met, married, and moved to Colorado. So let's look into some hobbies. And this is interesting. This is an interesting area for me because outside of Chris Watts, we really don't have much insight into what Kessinger enjoyed doing. It's most commonly known that she was very much into working out at the gym, having a structured workout routine and monitoring her meals. Additionally, she enjoyed being outdoors, taking road trips and being alone with nature. Absolutely nothing wrong with any of that. Those are the only things that I can see that are not directly a result of her relationship with Chris. I know many have questioned the sexual side of things, but I have a few thoughts on this as well. First and foremost, she was 30 years old, single, no children, and she was free to do anything she damn well pleased to do. Why as a society we continue to criticize a woman for having a healthy sex drive is beyond me and God knows at 30 years old it goes through the roof and before anyone passes any judgment just let me say this nowhere in the Bible does it say you cannot enjoy kinky sex with your spouse it's just not in the Bible I don't care how you want to spin it Christian non-believers whatever the point is is it's meant to be enjoyable within the covenant of marriage that's biblical What's normal to you may be boring to another, but let's get back to that marriage part of this. Sex, much like greed, hatred, lies, and many others are all sins that we've all fallen to at some point or another. It seems some forget that part. I'll return to this topic later, but for now, I'd like to note that a woman pulling out all the stops to keep a man entertained or satisfied will put herself in some very questionable positions. It's her way of proving she loves him more, so to speak. This, in my opinion, is where the wedding dress searches, pornography, and even the mention of having a baby comes into play. I have several theories on this as well, but for now, this will do. Something law enforcement mentioned that I felt was a little out of line when it came to Kessinger was their comment about the way, clearly, this was not the first time she watched pornography. Yet we, you know, this has led many to believe that she's always searched for it and she's always watched it. Yet we genuinely do not know that. Think of it this way. 
someone who watches porn all the time has seen a lot of different <clears throat> situations. I do not believe that it would be her first time or rodeo in the A department, if you know what I mean. If she was this disgusting, dirty, and kinky street girl, she was in a long-term relationship prior to Chris, allegedly for years with some fella named Sean that apparently has never let his face be seen since his case. This is one area where, in my opinion, law enforcement stirred the pot when it came to Kessinger. This was defamation from them. Keep in mind as well, Kessinger was an adult when all of the Fifty Shades of Grey books came out. And let's not forget about 365. You don't have to be actively searching porn sites online to stimulate the brain. You can read too. And I very clearly remember Kessinger telling law enforcement that she strongly encouraged Chris to read. Now, whether she was actually telling them to read books on family or whatnot, I don't know. But anywho, moving on. MLMs. Something to note about both Kessinger and Shanann was the MLM marketing sales. This, in my opinion, was another angle that Kessinger knew how to work. She is seen here wearing an origami owl necklace and I really wonder who her consultant was. We know Shanann was at one point selling and buying from Origami Al. According to Chris in his prison interview, Chris specifically mentions Origami Al. Was this an area where Kessinger maybe dabbled in the downline and wasn't able to make it profitable and so she did what many women do and cut her own losses? Did she share this experience with Chris and with MLMs and how ultimately, you know, she called BS on the amount of money coming in from Thrive. Kind of has the same vibe, if you will, to back with the kids in their allergies or their sickness. You know, this is just a day-to-day -day talk between a lover and, and her guy. And she's just saying, look, dude, like, I mean, I'm not trying to knock what your wife is doing, but like, I've tried MLMs before myself and you know, they make you think you're going to make money and then you really don't. And so just be careful. That may have been the extent if they even had a conversation, which I do believe they did because of her responses in the police interviews. But like, it's a basic conversation to have as a couple, but then you take it back and you go to a woman who is completely sold out to this MLM lifestyle and in her mind she's been successful she's got a nice house she's got you know a husband she's got her kids she's decorating and she's doing all the fun things and going on these trips you know the bank account doesn't even matter because she gets to do all these things and again it's not it's not a big you know moment so to speak but it should highlight the, the severity and the importance of even our small conversations we have with our friends on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether you, you know, and this is slippery slope for uh, male and female friends. People wanna argue all the time. I'm not gonna get on a rant, I promise. But they wanna argue, oh, you can have friends of the opposite sex. Well, yeah, you can, but you've got to be self-aware enough to know when you're struggling in one area or you're having an issue in one area to not be so heavily swayed by a gender or you know a person of the opposite sex when your commitment is to your wife and your family so again i could go off on a complete soapbox on that but i'm not going to point being simple conversations with differing opinions and he's listening to the mistress and then he's going back to his wife and having these conflicting you know conversations and it's basically turning this husband who always supported her in her ideas to now he's questioning what she's doing and I can't say that that would have actually been going over very well especially if Shanann was already suspecting that he was cheating that being said could thrive have been the gateway back into this family's inner circle you know, 
was it one of those things where Kessinger saw Shanann's post and she saw the getaways and the trips and maybe she was thinking, hey, maybe she is making some money on this thing. And she was kind of, you know, dabbling around, watching her videos and stuff, because keep in mind, it's all public. And was this the prime time to try another call to Chris? You know, keep in mind, back before they ever got married, was the phone call where the girl called Chris and Shania got mad. And Chris basically had to tell the girl that he couldn't talk to her. So now, if she's seeing that, you know, she's into this MLM stuff, she's all over social media, she can now see Chris in these videos, you know, it might have been a prime time to just shoot over a message and be like, dude, you're seriously in these videos? Like, gateway, straight up, slide into the DMs. Do we have proof of that? No, we don't, because she deleted, as well as he did, deleted his Facebook. They didn't deactivate it, they deleted it. So we don't have those messages. You know, Sh Shanann expanded her friends list to those working with Chris. Did Facebook do the same thing as it did like for me when I was in North Carolina? If Shanann started doing business with, you know, we saw Troy McCoy at the vision board party so one has to think that when they first started at Anadarko and you know, she was connecting with everybody and friend requesting everybody and that type of thing. So is it really that hard to believe that maybe there was another friend suggestion and boom, here pops up this woman whose name sounds very familiar or the mean faces video. Then the cycle repeats itself as it does with all covert narcissists. That supply was refueled in an overdrive for Chris. Now you have to be bought in in order to understand that. And that's going to be an episode on its own. So I'm not going to overly elaborate here, but your vision or your point of view on this entire crime will change depending on your beliefs about Chris Watts alone. It's my opinion that this began with Facebook messages back and forth then grew to her employment at Anadarko and eventually became physical that summer. They may not have met until 2018, but the emotional relationship as noted by Cindy Watts herself was known. So there was an emotional relationship known by his parents during that summer. So if he was comfortable enough to let his parents know about that emotional relationship, then it clearly had been going on, in my opinion, much longer than just that summer. It was something he felt confident was fixing, you know, was growing into something more, something that he could be proud of. And it was his way to move on and move past Shanann. Um, and I do believe that's what prompted that letter at his parents' house was he had basically told his parents, and this is speculation, I would love to hear from Cindy and Ronnie about it. Um, I'd love to interview them, but I do believe that at some point there was some sort of conversation that was had saying, look, if you're going to tell her you want a divorce, you need to basically cover all your bases. Cause if she loses her absolute mind, then you need to know that, you know, people need to know it wasn't you. And I really think that's where the letter came into play and people can question it all you want, but go watch a lifetime movie. It happens especially in small towns like North Carolina. You know, maybe he sent the friend request or DM to Kessinger, much like he did to Shanann, but we don't know because they both deleted their social media accounts. Why else do this besides not wanting anyone to see the initial date of contact between them? And this brings us to the phone ping. It is a fact that Kessinger's phone pinged that morning from a cell tower near the Watts home. This is significant because when tracking her normal patterns of travel to work, she would ping off of three other towers nowhere near this one. At the time, there was only one Verizon tower in Frederick. The distance between the tower at 2825 Saratoga Trail was less than one mile. And back then, you have to keep in mind they weren't as advanced as they are today. And back then, 
the carriers, you know, they weren't really sharing their towers. I don't know if you remember or not, but I know in certain areas it was like, like for instance, I never went to Verizon until I absolutely had to because they were so expensive. But like, if you had, um, see down here in Florida, if you had Boost Mobile, you would get decent coverage. If you had T-Mobile, you would get nothing. And so it really just depended on where you lived, where the towers were, as to which you know service provider was going to hey be guys. the better one. So for you to go never for, mind you my appearance, but I wanted to go ahead and just say that in this slide, I've tried to slow it down just enough so that you can maybe read along a little bit. But I did put the link in the description box below. It's actually a pretty interesting find when you look at the phone company because. Kessinger's family has a history for working for the company and I've seen it on several databases from the searches it's intertwined in with their family quite a bit so cell towers the knowledge of cell towers text messages that all of those things it was just I don't know I find it very interesting to say the least I mean that's probably not even the best word for that that Kessinger was asking about that so much in those early days in that early time period. And so I think it only supports what I just previously said about them not wanting anyone to have any idea of how long their actual relationship had been going on, uh, especially if they started out on social media. But if you get a chance, you want to come back to it, um, again, I'll put the link in the description below so you can actually read the full history of the cell towers and especially with the big buyouts. Additionally, she pinged off the same tower on the days when she places herself inside the Watts home. And that to me is important because I know people argue, oh, well, she could have just been on her way to work. Patterns are not going to lie coincidentally on the morning that an entire family disappears. I don't care how you want to swing that. On a jury, if I ever heard that, that alone would, that would be hard to discredit. I mean, like, I would have to see more or hear more before I would believe that that was not intentional. So this again is a fact that can be found via her phone records. And there are some great videos out there regarding the diagnostics of the phone ping. And I do re recommend deep diving into them. There's a couple, and I'll post some of the channels down below. Some of them, you know, it's from way back in 2018 when the initial discoveries came out, so they had a little bit more information than what the redacted discovery is showing, but you've got some channels who really have gone into um, the phone ping and mapping everything out of Kessinger, and I really, I didn't want to regurgitate what they were, what they have already said and shared, but I did want to at least give the foundational, you know, points for where this is coming in. So, um, for the purpose of this episode, I'm going to focus on the explanation for why I believe the phone ping is in fact significant and how I can best explain why it was not enough to arrest and charge Kessinger. Does it indicate guilt or innocence? Did Mr. Kessinger realize mid-interview that he was harboring a monster or was his daughter just making horrible moral decisions? Denial was all around. So here's one of my theories. I'm going to walk you through it only up to the point for this video. Again, once the series is completed, I'll come back in and kind of tweak these, you know, my goal is to basically finalize what the heck I think actually happened in this case because five years later, going all over the place with theories, it's just like, I really, I know that so many of us are like, we, we just want to have some better understanding as to what or why because the idea that justice was not served is just, it's sickening. So, here we go. In my opinion, the Lazy Dog meetup was going to be a final date between Kessinger and Watts. 
almost like a give me one more chance. Like, let's just go out to dinner. It doesn't have to be serious. Let's just go out to dinner. Because remember, he even said he wishes he had gone to the Rockies game. So I do believe that he was trying to pull away from Kessinger to some degree. The trip Shanann had planned for them when she returned, in my opinion, was going to be basically the Hail Mary of their marriage, and they both knew it. Shanann knew if that did not reset them, then it would essentially be over, as did Chris. Being a father and a family man who no doubt recognized that he had made some mistakes over the summer and something he thought was innocent flirting turned into far more than he originally ever thought it would. As I've mentioned before, I do believe there is a certain tone of voice that Chris uses in his prison interview when you can tell that he's telling the truth. When he said, I should have just gone to the Rockies game. I believe he genuinely feels this way. Think about it in the context of you're dating a narcissist. I've gone over this part more, or gone over this more in detail in part two of Hidden Motives, but I'll briefly explain. Chris, on more than one occasion, chose to leave Kessinger to appease his wife. There was a day in July 2018 when Chris received several missed calls from Shanann. He left Kessinger's home while she was in the middle of a shower and drove home. This infuriated Kessinger and she showed up to Chris's house uninvited. She places herself here as well as Chris states this was the day he had to quote unquote talk her off of a ledge. Now, if you've ever been this person or dated this type of person, you know this is a pattern of someone with emotional immaturity, jealousy, insecurities with the relationship, and in some cases, deeper emotional issues. Point being, she showed up because she did not buy the story that he gave her for leaving so abruptly. Now, let's fast forward to this 111 minute phone call which began at 9.28 p.m. Ironically, Shanann called Chris at 9.29 p.m. and he did not answer. She then texted him and he didn't respond because he was on the phone with Kessinger. Shanann then texts Chris about being late. So keep in mind, you're on the phone talking to somebody and you get an incoming call. He ignores it. Okay, whatever. You're on a call, you ignore an incoming call. Then Shanann texts, and Shanann texts and tells him the flight's delayed. They're gonna get in late. Do I believe that he did not see that text? No, I believe he read that text. And quite frankly, probably relayed that message right on over to Kessinger. So at 11.19 p.m., the phone call between Kessinger and Watts ends, and he texts Shanann saying that he fell asleep on the couch and that it's going to be late. One question I would ask Chris if I had a chance to was, did you tell Kessinger that Shanann's flight was delayed? I believe that she does note this in an interview with law enforcement. If he told Kessinger this at 9.44 p.m., and attempted to end things with her, the conversation on the phone would understandably continue a little while longer. Keep in mind, if this was not planned weeks in advance, which I don't believe it was, then that's one argument as to why they miraculously can't remember the contents of the call. Because let's think of it from this, you know, think of this from another angle. She's the mistress. If the husband is breaking things off with her, trying to yet again, and then the family goes missing, that launches her right at the center with a solid motive, in my opinion. That's the strongest motive for a woman scorn type scenario to come through. The flip side of this is where my attempt to defend Kessinger comes into play. Now, <laughs> hang in there guys. Continuing on with this 111 minute phone call, Chris backs down 
again and tells Kessinger that he and Shanann are going away for the weekend to try to rekindle their relationship. Keeping in mind that over the summer, he has not once come clean about this affair to Shanann. So woman to woman, it appears that Chris's plan is to act as if Kessinger just never existed. My guess is he told Kessinger Shanann was going to know because he paid with his card. So basically, Chris, and my theory is that Chris is basically telling Kessinger, look, like, we need to stop. This needs to end. It needs to stop. She's coming home. We're going to go away. We're really going to try to give this a go and see if this is going to work. Like, I have another kid coming. We need to figure that, see if this is going to work. And Kessinger, being a woman, not wanting to feel as if she's just being completely erased. I mean, it's almost like if Chris can get Shanann and his love life and their marriage back on track and Kessinger just gets tossed to the side after, in my opinion, a long courting or a long affair. I mean, the, the affair at least was a year, in my opinion. Um, and I discussed that in detail in the Hidden Motives and the August video. I firmly believe that affair was at least a year, and I think August was the anniversary of it. And now you've got Chris saying, look, she's on her, she's coming home, we're going away, we're going to try to work on this. Kessinger, yet again, is tossed to the side, and it's like, no. Well, you toss a woman to the side like that and you've messed with her head and you've been leading her on and you've been doing all this kind of thing. Um, honey, she's about to come tell your wife every freaking thing. Everything. And I would love to hear in the, th like in the comments below, if you've ever been in this type of situation, I would love to just hear if it's not like too triggering for you. How would you have handled that if you had found out that you were, you know, you were, you knew you were dating a married man and you can put it in a theory context so people aren't like being ugly and I will delete ugly comments, period, because nobody is a saint. But I will tell you, like if you've been in that type of situation where you felt like someone was just tossing you to the side in order to hide you and keep what, you know, what was going on hidden. If you had the opportunity to tell their spouse what was going on, would you do it? So, back to this. My guess is, he told Kessinger, Shanann was going to know about their relationship that he wasn't hiding in. She was gonna know because he used his debit card. And Kessinger, assuming that he's allegedly lied to her about being done with the marriage, that he's just now going to lie again to cover his tracks. The phone call ends at 11.21 p.m. And some would argue that Nate's camera triggering at 11.25 p.m. indicates that Kessinger arrived soon after the phone call ended. However, it's my belief as any typical woman scorned would have done, she got off the phone with Chris. She tried to go to sleep, but she couldn't. She was sick to her stomach because like her nerves were just shot. She even mentions that she did some laundry herself. And then in my opinion, she was just like, you know what, F it. Like I'm going over there and I'm gonna make sure this woman knows just how dirty this man is and how disgusted I am over this entire situation. She says, I was so disgusted over him and, um, what did she say? She didn't even put herself into that statement, but she mentioned she was so disgusted by him that in the whole thing. And so, if she's going to go tell Shanann just how disgusted she is, keep in mind, she was looking up wedding dresses prior to this guy's she was under the guise that they were getting serious. Then suddenly he wants to take a romantic trip, trip with his wife. So what has she done in the past when she was pissed off at Chris? Guys, she showed up. So please note the following is my personal opinion and therefore 
my personal accounts for what I believe may have happened that morning, resulting in no charges filed against Kessinger. Given the tire tracks out back and her knowledge of the ring doorbell camera, I believe she parked behind their house and entered either through the basement or through the sliding glass door at the back, as she's done several times. Um, this is why when she says in her interview, she can't remember whether or not it was during the phone call or not, but she says she remembers that there is no TV in the basement and she could hear the TV. Now we've all assumed that this was because she was on the phone with Chris and she could hear. She says she remembers saying, why the hell is he still up? And pay attention to the tone of her voice when she's describing this. When I go to bed and I could hear the TV on, which I thought was kind of weird. I didn't ask him. I just heard it in the background. And I remember thinking, and it was like right before we got off the phone, I was like, why the hell is he up? And there's like no TV downstairs, so it's like, well, maybe so I don't know. No TV in the basement where he usually calls you from. Yeah, and I don't know how many TVs they have. Like, I've never been in their bedroom. Like, I went upstairs once, and it was like to their little playroom, and I just like looked at it, and I was like, that's super cute that your girls have books, and that was like it. And other than that, I have never been in any of those rooms in that upstairs. Like to me, it was just like you don't know. Like, ever. I had no... So, I don't know if he has any other TVs. I'm assuming by, like, how much other nice stuff they have in their house. It wouldn't surprise me. So, I'm not quite sure what room he was in at that point. Um, but I just remember hearing the TV. And I was like... It was just weird to me. Because I was like, why are you watching TV right now? It was, like, super late. And that was the only and thing. He, he had phoned you? Or were you guys already talking when the TV was going on? I just remember, like, I, like, picked up on it, like, later, but I don't think it was, like, throughout the whole conversation. Like, I just remember it being towards the end because I remember thinking, like, wow, it's really late. She's on the phone. It's, like, one of two ways this goes, okay? She's either on the phone and hearing the television in the background, assuming that he's waiting up for her instead of being asleep in the basement. And that warranted her to drive by that morning. I'll straight up tell you, I don't really think that's what happened. Or what I believe, she was already in the home at 2825 Saratoga Trail. She could hear the TV upstairs and she distances herself specifically from their bedroom in this interview with law enforcement. She even goes on to say, I didn't know what room he was in at that point. She could only hear the TV. So let's think about where in the house would she be if she could only hear the TV. So let's review the footage of Shanian entering the house. And you guys, we see a bright blue light upon her opening the door. Some believe it was Shanann's phone, and her phone does have a little bit of a blue light to it, but that blue light would not light up the door frame like it did. However, it could also have been the television that we see on in the body cam footage in the day room just off the side from the kitchen. Chris says he fell asleep on the couch. Now, if you fall asleep on the couch and you know, you fall asleep to something, what is it, like a DVD or something, you know, the menu will just kind of like keep replaying over and over and over again. Or if you're watching like a sports network or the weather channel, if you will, um, you know, the weather channel's background is blue, typically. So if he fell asleep while on the couch watching TV, potentially while on the phone with Kessinger, so given the layout of their house, Kessinger would have been coming up the stairs from the basement and hearing the living room television just as Shanann was entering the house. So let that vivid image into your head for a minute. Chris knows Shanann's getting home late, so he decides to go sit on the couch downstairs and watch TV. And someone's coming up the basement stairs 
just as Shanann is walking in the door. Kessinger, if in fact, is walking up the stairs in the basement, she hears the TV and immediately she's thinking, what the hell? Like, it's one o'clock in the morning. Why are you still, you know what I mean? Like she's, I believe she came to the basement window because that's how she used to come in and, and be with him. Um, you have to keep in mind, he would sleep down in the basement, arguably for quite some time. And even if they were speculating, even if they were separated and living under the same roof, the woman's still not coming through the front door. So that's one theory. If she's coming up the basement stairs, Shanann walks in the front door, her suitcase isn't making it up those stairs because just as she's coming in, she sees another woman come out of the basement. And when that happens, you know all hell would break loose. I don't care how paint a picture, that ain't happening. That would have been World War III right there. And the, the yelling and the shouting, no doubt, would have awakened the kids. Or, the other side of this theory is once Shanann got home, she and Chris went upstairs. And in my opinion, one of two things happened. Keep in mind the girls were asleep and they're light sleepers. It's argued, argued that maybe she had just checked the monitor on her phone. So if she checked the monitors and the girls were asleep, you know, she's like, I'm not going to mess with them. Just, she just wants to go in and go to bed. She was tired. She didn't feel good. You know, she's pregnant. It's freaking miserable when it's that late and you've been on the flight. So, had they heard their mama, they would have gotten up. So, I don't know that I believe they immediately began a heated argument with each other. She may have mentioned the charge and or just said, you know, she needed to sleep because she was wiped out, but they needed to talk that morning. And so, that's why she asked them to please wake her up. I do believe, for whatever reason, the tone of voice he uses when he says she asked him to wake her up. I do believe that. I think that's truthful. And Chris, being the submissive that he is to the to most, you know, to most of it, if if he doesn't want to have this blowout argument with his wife at one o'clock in the morning because he knows he's got to go to work in the morning, then sure, like let's just lay down. You know, feels her crawl into bed. I don't doubt that. Um, maybe she crawled into bed or maybe it was like, look, we don't need to have this conversation tonight. I'm going to go lay on the couch and just watch TV until I fall asleep. Like you just stay in here or go to the basement. I don't care. Whatever. So then she goes and lays on the couch and this would make sense as to why Shanann's phone is in the couch cushions and the office, you know, being a mess. She wasn't supposed to be there, and I don't want to protect her, are two phrases, in my opinion, that Chris says that cost him his freedom. She didn't need his protection because she already had hers. Hers was identified as immunity. I've mentioned an interview I've had with a major in law enforcement. She has extensive experience in many different divisions with over 20 years of service, including homicide, and unrelated to this case, so she has no bias when it comes to this case. I did not tell her the specifics, did not tell her which case it was or anything of that nature, um, but I primarily asked her questions around some of the topics that we just seem to not be able to get any answers on. And I found, or excuse me, I found what she had to say was extremely eye-opening and honestly, what prompted this series because I realized at that point we may have been getting it all wrong so I hope you guys are ready for this immunity is only granted if someone has first-hand knowledge witnessed a crime or was directly involved in that crime Meaning, if Kessinger were there at Saratoga Trail that morning and either participated or watched what happened, 
then she would have the opportunity for immunity if what she said could be confirmed or corroborated with evidence. Now, that is <laughs> interviewed, and I even confirmed it again this morning before recording because I wanted to make sure I had that right. Let me read that again. Immunity is only granted if someone has firsthand knowledge, witnessed a crime, or was directly involved, meaning if Kessinger were there at Saratoga Trail that morning and either participated or watched what happened, then she would have the opportunity for immunity if what she said could be confirmed or corroborated with evidence. Now, that does not mean that little Miss Kessinger was necessarily sitting over on the couch going, oh my God, what do I do? Oh my God, what do I do? Um, go look up the Ken and Barbie killers. You will see very quickly that just because someone is granted immunity or given some sort of deal, it does not mean that in the moment the deal or the immunity is granted that the police have all of the facts. However, once the immunity is granted and that plea deal is signed and it is over with, they cannot go back and reverse her immunity. That again, um, if you want to, Unjustified has a fantastic, like it's a live series, the videos are long, but I'm telling you, if you just want to like listen and just familiarize yourself with the case, it is mind blowing what someone can get immunity for and walk. So the next part that everyone keeps asking about is witness protection. Witness protection is only granted if there is a direct threat to a person specific to a crime. It would have to be proven and have just cause for it. The only direct threats in this case, according to the discovery, are Chris Watts, who we know is incarcerated, Ronnie and Cindy, Frank, Frankie, and Sandra, and Jamie. Those are the only people, according to the discovery that we have, that are directly related to the victims and the perpetrator of this crime. If she does not have a direct threat from any of them, she would not be considered protected. Immunity does grant a level of protection. However, um, witness protection is not like this lifelong thing. And I did confirm that with law enforcement. It's not like you go into witness protection and you're in it for the rest of your life. There has to be an active threat pertaining to a specific crime that is what you need protection from. So in this case in particular, Frank, Frankie, and Sandra have come out and said, regardless of how, you know, screwed up the whole situation was, no matter how pissed off and angry they were, no matter how much they wanted her to be a part of it or to have been guilty for something, they can't, you know, they can't prove it or, or they don't believe that she was anymore. And I know we've all been kind of like, what the crap? But think about it, guys. Just think about it. They have to be able to say, like, look, we're not going after her. The Watts are not going after her. And Chris is in freaking prison for the rest of his life. So as far as this case is concerned, as far as what we know from the redacted discovery, there's no reason for her to necessarily be under protection. So then, of course, my next question was, well, what about the media? You know, you've got YouTubers, you've got creators, you've got paparazzi, you've got, you know, the news channels. 
and I was informed that that is not an indicator, nor is that um, a reason or cause to grant witness protection for somebody. They will not be granted witness protection because of the media. They will not be granted witness protection because of their reputation. Like, you know what, you wanna be a family wrecker or home wrecker or whatever you wanna call it. You wanna have an affair with a married man. Too bad, you're gonna wear that scarlet, scarlet letter and that's just gonna be that. Um, which I thought was really interesting because then that brought me to <laughs> the other question that I had. And I wish, I wish so badly that I would have been recording, like video recording this interview because I looked at the major and I said, why would anyone use the term safe house? I wish you could have seen the look on her face. And you have to understand how direct this major is too. Like she's, she's a no BS kind of woman. Like she's straight shooter, straight forward. She looked straight at me and she said, what was she already mixed up in? So this, in my opinion, could explain a lot. And with that, thank you guys so much for being here and being patient for this video. I look forward to sharing with you episode two, where I will go further into my interview with law enforcement and we will review videos and audio and interviews of different questionable behavior and responses. And I will share with you why I believe those things were intentionally, in the words of Mr. Fessinger himself, pounded down until there was nothing left. Thank you guys.